Hey, folks, we're moving on to our next book. So hopefully you've gotten to the point where you've uh, caught up with the chapters. We're only doing chapters one through five for right now. But even if you're not caught up, or even if you didn't buy the book, the information we're doing in these things can be really helpful. And actually, because we read it and we're presenting it, it really streamlines the process. So you really don't have to sit down and listen to the audio or read the book. I really advise doing that because there's lots of things in there that we don't cover necessarily because I, I, mean, I can't cover all of it, all of it. But if you just want a gist of it and going over some of the basics, like we're trying to help. So hopefully you find some of this information useful. Okay. So our new book is Fanatical Prospecting. Um, it's by Jeb Blunt. And it's almost the opposite of our last one. The last one is Chris Smith, and it was very technical. He did a lot of scripting and a lot of A, B, C, D. First you do this, then you do this, then you do this. Um, this book is going to be same concepts, but in a motivational sense. It's not going to be like, here's how you do it. Here's it. You should be doing it, and you have to be doing it, and get off your butt and do it. So these chapters might go through a lot faster for us. There's not a ton of notes. There's some one-liners and things as you read through that you'll like, that you'll pick up and enjoy. But it's got a different tone to it than the last one. So hopefully you're enjoying it. If you have questions or any advice about reading it, if you're not sure you want to read it, let us know. So now that we get into it, uh, chapter one, and he talks about the reference. I put the email or the website on there, www.fanaticalprospecting.com. He references it very frequently. So here it is, and you get a free membership if you bought the book. And I bought the book off Kindle. It was like 12 bucks 15 bucks and the website to use the website's like 28 dollars. so right there you get a, a good deal so if you want to jump on there and obviously i'm not making any money or anything on that i'm just trying to help you get some more information so there it is and he talks about it very often he bet, essentially he's going to take that first chapter to say get off your butt and pick up the phone that's it that's all of chapter one get off your butt and get on the phone and um he says lots of things like easy is the greatest marketing hook of all time because he continues to talk about things that uh, he excuses he gets when he goes out and does seminars and does trainings and when he gets hired to come in and do things a lot of people say hey there's not enough leads or they're not good leads or these aren't quality leads and but by the time he sits down with these salesmen or women um in the first like hour he's like we just doubled their conversion rate and we just doubled this and tripled that and didn't do anything that they weren't already doing except trying to make phone calls instead of finding ways not to make phone calls. Um, and they also talked about the idea of prospecting is hard. It's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, everybody would do it and everybody would be selling, everybody would be selling millions of dollars of real estate. It's only the people that actually get off their butt and make those phone calls and talk to people and interact with others. They're the only ones that are making the money, that are selling the houses, that are being productive. So. It's supposed to be hard. So when you start working harder, not everybody else is there with you. You're, you're doing better than them. That's the idea. That's the concept. Um, and that's basically the, the chapter one. He doesn't even talk about scripts. He even says somewhere in there that you don't even bother with scripts. Just pick up the phone and talk to people. That if you're looking for a perfect conversation, if you're looking for perfection, you're going to miss out on all your opportunities. So um, he even gives examples of people that like go on Google and try to find the person or maybe on Facebook and get a little information about it. By the time you sit there and look up who it is that just called you that cold lead or even that lukewarm lead, um, you're going to lose a chance to even talk to them. So you just pick up the phone, and that's all of Chapter 1. Get off your butt, pick up the phone. The next thing is he talks about uh, some ways to make it easy on yourself a little bit, you know, some ways to ease it for uh, so less nervous and, you know, he talks quite often about uh, the, the hands getting all sweaty and breaking out in sweats about making cold calls and things like that. He talks about it and advises that you should try to find patterns. If you find patterns in people and find patterns in conversations, you find success. I think we did talk about that in the last book a little bit where there's certain things we as realtors are always going to ask people. Have you been pre-approved by a lender? Uh, what's your credit score? And there's questions that we developed when we did the last book that you can use those as patterns and you know what you're asking for. It helps make the conversations easier. And uh, Kevin and I were just talking about it. Most of the conversations, the way I learn how to do it is um, ask a lot of questions. Ask your cold calls, all those people, they love talking about themselves. Ask them questions. You don't necessarily need a script. And that's how I learn. And that's how a lot of agents learn is just to be a good listener. <laughs> just pick up the phone. Ask them about the property that they're looking at. Ask them if they've been in the neighborhood. Do they know if there's any listings? Why is that one so appealing? Have they seen a lender? Questions you need to know anyway. And the more you get them talking about themselves and what's going on, the more likely they're going to trust you and know you. So find those patterns in the conversations. Know what kind of questions to ask. 
and it just makes it easier for yourself. You'd be less nervous because of those things. Um, he also talks about, in quite at length, uh, be thirsty for knowledge. He says, all the people that he trains, he tells them, you know, keep trying to get better, keep learning new things, go to podcasts, go to YouTube, read a book, go to audiobooks, do things, but don't stop learning. And, and some of the stuff can really apply to what you're doing. Some of it can be things you just end up having conversations. Have you learned like a couple of quotes or if you watch a Tom Ferry video and you come up with a quote there or information here or even a TED Talk, any of that stuff, you're making yourself smarter. It doesn't have to be lead conversion stuff. It can just be common knowledge things that you can break into conversations. The smarter you are, the more conversation you have, the better off it is. And then he talks about adopt, adapt, and adapt. And we did talk about that a little bit with the Chris Smith stuff as well. And he talked about pivoting. Ask a few people some questions. Kind of see what their answers are. Make some changes. If, if you have a conversation that, uh, let's say you're in a listing presentation, for example, and they don't want to do open houses, well, don't spend the rest of your presentation talking about how great you are at open houses. Make that adjustment ad and adapt and talk about how you do videos instead or how you do pictures and how you avoid open houses. So you have to be flexible. You have to make that pivot. You have to adopt and adapt. So three. You see, this one's moving along a little faster. These ones are a lot easier. <laughs> this is three. Um, <clears throat> it's not about the call itself, it's about your willingness to interrupt. And he talks about that for quite some time, that good salespeople are okay with interrupting people and finding calm ways, easy ways to interrupt people on their regular days. It's going to happen if somebody calls you or it's a cold call or whatnot, you're probably going to interrupt what they're doing. You just have to kind of mentally prepare for that and, you know, be a little more polite. Apology, I apologize for the interruption or... You know, ask them questions of them. Try to be polite, be nice to them. It's, it's, you're going to interrupt them. Be okay with that and, and accept it. So when you make these calls, you're mentally prepared for those types of things. Um, and natural to hate rejection. So he talks about the reasons people don't go call. One is because they don't want to be rejected, and that's a big one. Um, you don't want people to not like you or to say no to you, and it's going to happen. And it's going to happen quite often. But... If 10 no's becomes a yes, it's better than zero no's. You know, you, you, you don't make any calls at all. At least you get a yes out of some of those. And he talks about that concept of, you know, you got to get yourself out there. you got to accept some of the no's if you're going to accept some of those yeses. They can't all be yeses. There's no way. So kind of mentally prepare yourself for some rejection and, um, and as I say, the rejection and pain. I think those are the two things that people hate the most that they can't accept, that they don't like, that they do anything they can to avoid those things. So mentally accept those things. Be okay with a rejection once in a while. And even when they reject them, this is the key. Continue to be polite. Oh, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Because if you just reject and then get all salty and hang the phone up, they're never going to call you back. But if you're still polite, maybe you can check back in with them a few months later. Check on them a couple of weeks later. Just because they say no right now does not mean they're always going to say no. So kind of accept that fact as well. So if they say no... And there's some objection handling stuff on the Tom Ferry. I mean, there's a lot of objection, objection handling things. But if those don't work and you still get a no, follow back up with them later. Be polite. Be known as that polite person that called at 5 o'clock and interrupted dinner. But it was so nice. Be that kind of person. All right, chapter 3. Moving on to 4. Um, and these are all like such common sense topics. Uh, chapter 4 talks about lunacy is, a, is the philosophy that all one size fits all. And that's just not going to happen in the industry. Some people like text messages. Some people like phone calls. Some people like video messages. Some people like emails. You have to be adaptable. And maybe that's one of the first things you want to talk to the person about. Say, hey, how is it the easiest to get a hold of you? Should I email you? Should I call you? What is the easiest and best way to reach out to you? Um, even with rejections, like, yeah, maybe it doesn't work for you now, but hey, can I call you back in three weeks? Or even say, you know, what's the best way to reach you? I just want to be sure that I'm remaining helpful and answering all the questions you have. Is email the best way to do that? Be flexible, be adaptable, which moves into the next one, which is mix it up. And the mix it up part, he gives them some more specific examples of like emails and that kind of thing. Um, one of the ones that seems to be working well for me, and Kevin and I just talked about it, is when you get a number, if you do get a number, we're getting a lot of emails through our follow-up boss day lately, but if you get some phone numbers, sometimes I do a text message video first, and that way they know that I'm a real person, I'm an automated system, that I'm, I'm alive. And I'm there to help them. And then sometimes, more often, that, that creates a dialogue and they go back and forth. Um, and after maybe a back and forth a little bit, you try calling them. Say, hey, you know, uh, I just had to call. I was on the road or I'm getting in the car and I had to follow up with a call. I, we were having such a great dialogue. I wanted to be sure that 
I was remaining helpful and I was doing what I can for you. So a lot of times the video messages lead to a conversation, but be sure you do something to interact with them, mix it up a little bit. Um, if it's a cold lead, maybe sometimes send a postcard, maybe sometimes leave a video message, sometimes a text message, you know, whatever, whatever works. Maybe sometimes stop by and accidentally leave a door knocker on their house. I just happened to be in the neighborhood when you knew that you were there for them, but you get a chance to knock down a couple of neighbor, neighbor doors or whatever works for you. So mix it up, try to do the best you can with all the different styles. And then the last one we had a chuckle at when I was talking to Kevin, 80% of the time of a good salesperson is spent prospecting. So just stop and think to yourself, one second, how much time do you spend prospecting? Now I'm not quite sure 80% is per day or per week or per month. It really isn't that specific with that number, but the concept is there that you should be spending a decent chunk of your day uh, prospecting. And if you're like, I'm too busy for that, then you're too busy to be successful. You know, you have to spend some time with people. You have to reach out to them once in a while, even if it's a quick text or a quick email or, hey, how are things going? Just something, anything. And if you need to, set a time. Just like from noon to two, noon to one every day, I'm, I have an appointment. My appointment is reaching out to prospects. And if it's important to you, you're going to make that a priority. You're going to say well, from noon to one or whatever time works for you, I'm reaching out to people. I'm doing it. And if somebody wants to go see a house, sorry, I have an appointment. Can we do 130? Can we do 115? Can we do 110? All right. And set that aside. Make that a priority. You got to do it. I've even admitted this lately, last couple of weeks, I have not been doing a great job of this, but I'm starting to make adjustments to my schedule. And we're going to do some different things, not just calls and videos during the times that like I'm running around like a crazy person, <laughs> showing houses and doing things. So I have a plan B, and I'll definitely have that 80% back up to where it should have been and it's been over the last few months. Um, he talks about the law of need. He actually spends quite a bit. He sends a lot of the chapter talking about the law of needs. And what he says, the law of need is that if you're in a situation of desperation, like I have to sell this house in order to pay my rent, or I need to get this uh, tenant into a house in order to get my commission check to feed my child, those are the times of desperation that no one's going to buy from you. They can smell desperation from a mile away. They know that you're just trying to sell them. You're not trying to help them. It's a big difference trying to help people versus trying to sell people. So never be in that position. If you're doing that 80% of the time prospecting, you won't be in a position of desperation. And that's what he's talking about, that you always have a pipeline of people that you're reaching out to, that you're talking to, you're communicating. And then he makes that connection between the 80% of the time you're prospecting to the 30-day to 90-day. All these kind of tie in together. And he says if you spend the 30 days reaching out to people and talking to people, you won't see the results for at least 90 days from there, usually, typically, right? So don't just call somebody on the first of the month and expect them to buy and sell a house by the 15th. That's not the way it works. They're going to buy or sell a house 90 days from now, three months from now, which means you need to plan in advance. You need to start getting a hold of the person for that first of the month, anticipating you get some of those prospects, some of those leads to work out. And you got to give yourself some time, three months, four months to get those things working out. And if you don't, you're going to see the big curve. You're going to see